When I first met Jose, I had been recently diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, so I was in that state of mind where you feel like your life is over and you're completely terrified and you have had many tests and encounters with machines and technicians and you don't yet have the feeling that you're in the hands of anything other than sort of a random fate. I would never forget sort of the door opening and my walking into this office and this uh, man standing up and saying, my name is Jose Baselga and I'm familiar with your work from the Spanish translations and I know what my job is. My job is to protect your mind. So if you don't mind, um, sit down and explain to me how you write a poem. And I thought to myself, he reads poetry. Um, if he doesn't read poetry, he has done me the courtesy of just looking up to see who I might be as a human being. He's asked me about my work. Uh, he hasn't referred yet to my illness. He hasn't treated me like a person who is diseased. He hasn't treated me like anything other than a person who's going to continue to live and whose dignity and whose sense of the worth of their life has been instantly made implicit and explicit in the conversation. So I sort of try to explain how the imagination works and he took notes. Everything begins with the heart. Everything begins with passion. Everything begins with mission because we are going to be only successful if we are totally committed to what our day lives look like. He was to oncology what Jobs, Williams, Bezos have all been to the areas that they're in. He developed 13 or 14 drugs that saved millions of patients' lives. A drug called uh, Herceptin became a standard of care. A single person that transformed the way that uh, we do oncology at Valdebron. Jose came here with no influence, no connections whatsoever. He was an American success story. When he got to Mass General, the place started to move and shake a little bit. He came to Memorial with a real sense of urgency to bring the best out of the institution. To be a visionary, you have to be disruptive almost by nature. That's part of what made people uncomfortable around Jose. He is known as the father of precision medicine. He was tougher on himself than he was on the people around him. The goal is making a difference for patients. Most difficult times in his life was he had to resign from Memorial Sloan Kettering. When he left Memorial, of course, we would have to deal with some criticism. What is a loss for Memorial would be a gain for AstraZeneca. Because he was a visionary, when I started to think about medicine, he always said, don't think about oncology, because by the time you get to where I'm at, I will have taken care of it. Today, we are fiercely leading a revolution in oncology which will change the practice of medicine and the way we do research forever. So there was something that was surprising and fun about me, that is that he really was not afraid of anything and he also never said no. In Spain, he would do the bullfighting and the running with the bulls. He did that since he was 14. That's something that he loved part of his identity and, and, and even after he had this he continued to do that and until my mom you know after my brother Alex was born was okay like enough that you know you, you have too much responsibility to have a freak accident here. One day when I was sitting with him in his office he pulled up a photo of himself in the corrida with the bull. He was a young man it was clearly a provincial corrida he was in blue jeans and a t-shirt and we mustn't forget that Jose was an immigrant to this country and a fairly recent one but he looked at that photograph and he said, you see that bull, that bull is cancer, and I will defeat that. And the thing about that metaphor is that, you know, when you encounter a creature in a ring and you're a Spaniard and you understand what you're doing in the most profound sense, you respect the bull. You know the bull can kill you. You know the bull has more power than you will ever have. It's a much stronger creature, it's canny, it's intelligent, and it has a will to live. So there was a thing about Jose, which is that you know he did not disrespect cancer and he did not underestimate how powerful an adversary it was. Um, and he knew that he had to engage his full humanity to rise to the occasion. And he needed our full humanity as patients in us alive and operating in order for us to be able to fight that bull in that arena. 
growing up, we had this house in the Prenice, and that was like my dad's happy place. It's um, like an hour away from Barcelona. It's between the border of um, Spain and France. Um, and so we grew up hiking, going to the mountain. That's something that he loved doing and that he passed on to us as a passion. He is one of the kind of person who just hated doing nothing. He always had to be doing something and he would like kind of get like very antsy of like, you know, I'm wasting my time. I need to like be doing something. So I think um, nature kind of felt like a good place to disconnect from work and, and his thoughts, but at the same time feeling like you're accomplishing something. One of his favorite things to do was dirt biking. Um, he had two titanium plaques in his arm because yeah. he it broke it. Motorbike yeah. racing. I would always, me and him would always go with him. He, he liked to go fast. Uh, <laughs> right behind the house that we had, there's like this huge field, like Les Campada. Yeah. Um, and he would literally, he would literally take us out there and we would just literally like do rounds and rounds around a circuit for literally hours till it became Jumping too dark. and doing crazy yeah. things, I remember. Yeah. My grandma always tells these stories that like he loved his motorcycle so much. Someone had kind of broken into like the neighbor's garage and had taken all their motorcycles. So then my dad basically decided that his motorcycle had to sleep in the house with them. <laughs> so so the every room. night he was in the middle of the he was in the middle of the living room. And somehow my dad was able to like my grandma was like let him do all these things, but it was just wild to me. But even I remember one time that uh, you know the president of Memorial called me telling me very seriously that Jose shouldn't be doing biking, motor dirt biking, because he was a very important person in the hospital and that was putting a risk his life. And he didn't care. I mean, he could <laughs> bike and go around. I mean, he loved to do that. He actually started doing internal medicine when he started his residency in Spain. But then he started to realize that a lot of the patients that were coming in were, were cancer patients, and that, that were, those were the ones that were more likely to die. So to him, he just saw it as like a big challenge. I think when he grew up, he didn't think there was anything else than medicine because that's what he lived in his house. The grandfather was a doctor, his father was a doctor, the mother was a nurse. One of his uh, sisters is also a doctor. They have uh, eight, nine nephews that they're doing medicine. So everybody would call him asking for advice. And, you know, he's always there for anyone. So that I think it helped him and, and it would keep him very, very close to his family. His grandfather was the doctor of the town of Cardona, the one where he would do the bullfighting and, and the, were riding motorcycles, etc. Everything he did was very service driven. It was something that he inherited from his dad. It was basically like, if you have been giving a gift, you deserve to give back to society. And he used to say to me, you know, the best way you can combine the efforts of the heart and the efforts of the brain is in medicine. Through the Spanish colony, we met in New York. He was doing his residency in Kings County, and I was in the finance industry. He explained me his story, how he got all the way to Kings County. It was very hard because he came from a university that no one knew at that time in, in the United States. I met Jose uh, in uh, 1986 when we were both interns in training at Kings County Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn. During the initial training in internal medicine, you do one year, the first year, which is an uh, internship, and then the second and third called your re residency. But during the second year of your training, you start thinking about what's my next move? What do I want to do? But Jose, you know, although we all declared our interest in, uh, for, for oncology, I think Jose was ahead of all of us because he knew he wanted to do his fellowship training at Sloan. And, um, and therefore, he made his plans uh, how to get there. So he started going to do some electives and then work on uh, research projects and establish connections and knowing that this will lead him to get there and be selected as a fellow there. And finally, he got this mentorship with John Mendelssohn, who was the person who interviewed him for the fellowship. He started to work in the AGF receptor. John Mendelssohn at Sloan Kettering developed an antibody against a protein called EGFR. The idea was that EGFR is expressed on almost all of the epithelial types of cancer cells. And that if you treat these cancer cells with an antibody against this protein, that you can actually kill the cancer cells. So Jose absolutely believed it. He thought that this was clearly going to be a winner. The rest of us thought this is kind of, you know, wishful thinking. They actually got this antibody into a clinical trial. 
and they'd go down to the clinics and just plead with people to put their patients on this trial. And everybody would nod their heads and uh, politely turn around and walk away and, you know, make disparaging comments like, I can't believe they think this antibody is going to work. I mean, here we are giving patients chemotherapy. You think an antibody is going to kill cancer cells? But it did. That antibody is now FDA approved for a colon cancer and head and neck cancer. Jose had that kind of intuition that we didn't have. I started my medical oncology career uh, now about 20 years ago. And at that time, I was very inspired about the advances in HER2 positive breast cancer. Jose was at the forefront with the work that he was doing uh, with trastuzumab, also known as Herceptin. So I have seen him present, seen his ability to translate really complex pathways into very simplified mechanisms that can be then used to exploit better therapies. My career started in the early 90s in the lab of John Mendelssohn. These were very exciting times because we were able to show that you can target a protein, and this was HER2. Maybe we could use antibodies to target HER2 tumors so that they could shrink and actually disappear. So that was the birth of Herceptin, of Trastuzumab. And at that time, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, we did the initial phase two study of Herceptin in patients with advanced HER2 positive breast cancer. It's really huge. Uh, and, and, and again, open the door for, for more to come in that space. Now there's more you know, antibodies, ADCs, antibody drug conjugates, uh, small molecule inhibitors. But it was one of the first approaches that used targeted therapy uh, in breast cancer that changed the landscape of treatment. This particular agent has been used in 2.3 million breast cancer patients. So, you know, there's so much that is still happening as a result of his work and his uh, and, and the other 12 or more um, therapeutic agents that he developed. The classical path is to treat patients that have very advanced disease and probably do not have other treatment options. But Jose always had in mind that uh, we should treat more and more early stage cancer. But he also thought that uh, we should do more and more to prevent cancer. Actually, Jose was one of the very few people that thought that uh, cancer could disappear from the face of the wall. He recruited excellent laboratory researchers. He trained and recruited excellent clinical researchers. And he made sure that they were talking, interacting, and benefiting from each other's knowledge. And this term that we now have for that type of research is translational research, translating findings from the lab to the clinic and from the clinic to the lab. Of course, that's intuitively what we want to do in cancer research, but it, it's really been a little bit more of a modern development, and Jose was really at the forefront of that development. Jose was uh, not, uh, not bullshitting. A objective, uh, deliverables, timelines, and this since the beginning. I was uh, very young to pharma, and I was interacting with him in the context of some trials that he was the PI of. The first thing, when you could have Jose Basel a PI of your study, this was a, a good uh, uh, thing to increase your probability of technical success. Jose uh, smelled the good drugs. It was unbelievably, his track record in uh, positive phase three readout, uh, I, I don't know, but it's, it is, uh, it is, it is uh, unbelievable. The only way that that actually was meaningful is if it made its way as fast as possible into a medicine that could actually benefit patients. And so that was his North Star, and that is the nature, and that's the magic of uh, the drug discovery business, is that interface between research and development, that interface between development and real-world delivery. He worked very, very hard, long hours. You know, as a young, you know, wife, I was like really surprised because I thought, well, we don't have time to be together, but he was so passionate. It was very uh, hard on himself and he was very hard on people because he wanted the same uh, drive and the same commitment from everybody. There is no draft that you send to Jose. You have to have essentially a final product that you think is ready. You just label it as draft because you know it's going to be brutally reviewed. I look at this memory very fondly, looking back into it, but I don't know how fond it was at the moment, but I was in the eighth grade, uh, and I had like a two-month, like six-page assignment, and I had the terrible idea 
of showing it to my dad the night before it was due. Uh, and I had always been afraid of showing my work to my dad just because I had heard the screams and the him ripping the papers of my siblings' essays. <laughs> and so I was like terrified. Like, I was like very proud of it too. So I was like, that's what I'll show you, you know, like get a good first impression. I could just tell by his facial expressions, like he's getting red and he's like yeah, yeah. getting upset, right? He's like the whole page, like literally underlined with like huge X's, like just marking entire pages. Um, and I'm like having like a little mental breakdown, not letting him <laughs> see it, but freaking out, right? Then he rips it apart and he's like, we're gonna be spending all night working on this. Three to four hours sitting together in the computer. He had to work the next morning. He changed the topic of the whole essay, <laughs> but I had six weeks to work on and he, did it in, yeah. and he did it in four hours. Jose was not a, an easy person, right? So I think that everyone that worked with him uh, realized and, and acknowledged that he was a, a hard worker, uh, very demanding. But five minutes after, you could take a coffee with him and he was very relaxed and, and, and with an excellent friendship. We would brainstorm about all kinds of really interesting ideas and then we'd sort of stop for a moment and think, wow, that would be amazing. But then, you know, the skeptic would take over and say, well, but it seems a little crazy too. I mean, can we really do this? And Jose was, was always very, he would say, yeah, you know, in this cancer type, I think it would be really difficult. But, but maybe in this cancer type, let's think about this. It might be possible over here. And so with Jose, he was always taking the approach, let's not start with the reasons why it can't work. Let's start with, well, how might it work, even though we know it's going to be hard. So I think that that was a, that was a magnetizing uh, element of Jose's persona. People were drawn to him. Uh, he was a natural born leader. He was a natural born friend, a very humble guy, great sense of humor always interested in other people, wanted to know what you were doing. He, he could remember the names of everybody's spouse and kids. When he came back after his first year of the fellowship at Memorial, they had a family dog. Um, a it was a Cocker Spaniel, and he was like petting it. And then he, he noticed a lump on the dog. He was like, I think this, his dog has cancer. You know, like you're <laughs> just, you're losing it. You know, like I think this, this dog is old, it's fine. So then my dad is like, no, 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 like I'm 100% convinced and we need to like, give surgery to this dog uh, right away. So they went up to my grandfather's office and they had surgery on the dog that night. And he was, he was right. He, the dog had, um, had cancer and, and mm. he, this was like made when the dog was like eight and it lived until it was like 18. And of course, every other family would have been like, absolutely not, you're not doing surgery on Especially this dog. On but he it was, also, it was, like, was like, it was Christmas night. Yeah. Favorite. yeah, it was Christmas yeah, night yeah. too. If dad was certain about something, you weren't gonna tell him he wasn't gonna do it. Yeah, yeah, he also yeah, got like away you, with you, so much. You were, you were, <laughs> yeah. yeah, like you were, you were gonna stop him. <laughs> yeah. In the past, it was all about hitting cancer hard. But at the same time, a lot of normal cells would also get injured through the collateral damage. So then the focus really became, how do we define the Achilles heel of the cancer cell and go after that precisely. The concept of precision medicine, the right drug for the right patient at the right time. And that really sort of helped to define the next generation of new therapies. And Jose was right there writing the chapter of precision medicine earlier and recognizing that earlier than anyone else. He pretty much ushered in the era of targeted therapy. Um, while we were all doubters, he, he knew it was going to work. He is known as the father of precision medicine and molecular targeted therapies. During his presidency at the ACR in 2015-2016, he put on a genomics and clinical medicine think tank to try to figure out how genomics can really improve therapeutic efficacy in patients. He was obviously a giant in cancer. He was also a giant on digital data and AI he had, through his career, participated in, in a lot of different startups in technology and how they could, you know, with data, with AI, with digital. Many of the trials will have incorporated digital approved devices that will monitor in real time how is the patient really doing. Is this patient walking? Is this patient having pain? Is this patient having difficulty breathing? That will be analyzed and then we will be able to intervene. I was missing home, so, you know, I was telling him why we don't go back to Barcelona, and, you know, at that time he didn't want to come back because he said, look, I'm in Memorial, one of the best hospitals 
uh, for cancer in the wall. Why am I going to come back to Barcelona? I'm no one there. I'm going to go there. I'll have a little desk with a little phone. And maybe they're going to let me see some patients on the floor. Maybe because it was so persistent and at that time, I say, well, you know, Sylvia's been here for uh, all the way to 96, maybe we should give a chance and to go to Barcelona. Coming back from MSK, coming back from US to to Spain and to start from scratch in a place where new, you know, was not in the map. And he put Valdebron and VHIO in the map, still is. And it's where I jumped in actually. And I it was where I saw the transition from Valdebron Oncology to the Valdebron Institute of Oncology and what is now. Uh, one of the best institutions in Europe for clinical trials and translational medicine. The time that he came back to Barcelona, Jose, actually Pepe, as he liked it to be called, changed completely the way that oncology was done at Valdebron. He introduced precision medicine, especially the collaboration with all the professionals at the clinical uh, care level, but at the same time with, uh, with all the investigators at the lab to treat and to diagnose our patients in the most uh, efficient way. So he always was in a hurry, and he would always us in a hurry. But everyone recognized that Valdebron was one of the pioneer centers that do, for example, pharmacodynamic studies with uh, sequential tumor biopsies for patients. This was one of the outstanding uh, contributions uh, that we did since uh, the creation of the institution. At that time in Spain, we had very limited resources, so he created also a foundation so to try to bring some uh, funds for, uh, for the research in cancer. And finally, their patients love him, and he had a lot of patients in Barcelona. He didn't care who they were. I mean, but you, you know, we go to the streets of Barcelona, and still people stop us saying, you know, Jose did that, Jose did the other thing, and he was very close to everybody. I mean, everybody called him Jose. I mean, it was not only Dr. Roselga, but it was Jose. We were at the National Institutes of Health in front of the National Cancer Institute, awaiting the arrival of the Queen of Spain, and um, and Jose turned to me and said well, you know, this is going to be exciting for you. Wait till you see what she does. And I said, well, she'll smile and walk by. And he said, no, no, she'll smile and walk by, but then when she gets to me, she's going to give me a kiss. And I said, no way, Jose, that's not going to happen. Queens don't kiss people. And he, and he laughed and laughed. And she got out of the vehicle and came over and walked along and uh, smiled at everyone and then kissed him. And he turned to me and he nodded and uh, I smiled and I said, "You, o it always happens for you, doesn't it, Jose? You, know, <laughs> you always get to the bullseye. I met Jose as a clinical and research fellow when both of us were at the crossroads. I was trying to decide what to do during my research years, uh, during the fellowship, and he, was trying to decide whether to move from Europe to the United States and start a new position at the Mass General Hospital as the chief of division of hematology and oncology. We came back to the United States um, in 2010. People who were coming out of the university in Barcelona will have no jobs. There was an unemployment rate for young people around 40 or 60 percent. So he was like really um, concern about what is going to happen with our children if we stay here. For context, at that time I was um, 17 years old and I was having the time of my life. I went from being able to, you know, see my friends, move in anywhere I wanted, even like outside of the city, to my mom has to drive me <laughs> anywhere. Um, looking back, there's also a lot of great things that, that happened. I feel like we also got closer to our dad too. When he was working in in Spain, he would, you know, come back at 10. But it, when he was in Boston, our nuclear family became a lot closer. For Jose to come from Barcelona, where he's much more than just a researcher, a physician, or head of the unit, he's almost an icon there. Now he comes to a place like Mass General, which is the oldest and largest teaching hospital of Harvard Medical School. It's a lot of smart people. To be able to get a lot of smart people to all move in one direction, his picture should be in the dictionary next to the word charisma. And I have one final slide. I know that Boston is a city of excellence in many fronts. I know you have the best baseball team in the world that I learned, but you have the best football team in the world 
that I learned. <laughs> but what you don't have is the best soccer team in the world. And this is our stadium, uh, the Barcelona football team. They threw me a football party in the field. I started in Barcelona, where it's, where it's been six years, then I moved to MGH. As far as I know, I was the only one from Aldebron, actually, that was asked to follow into MGH. And Jose asked me to basically uh, start a new lab from scratch and run his lab there. So he was never afraid of risking, like never in his career. And we improved all the time, we improved all the time. Maybe we were also lucky, but we hired more and you know, better people and we publish better papers, and that is a positive feedback, usually. I'm not sure people realize this about Jose, but he was at times full of doubt. And you can even say, perhaps, insecure. So there were these rare moments, usually at the end of the day, where he would open up and, and you realize this, this doubt. It can be hard to set up uh, new kinds of clinical trials and and to apply new kinds of techniques to patient-derived tissue. Those things can be really hard. But Jose had the ability to sort of get to the learnings that were possible from the breakthroughs that were happening in targeted therapies and the ways that they might be benefiting patients. And so when he got to Mass General, he really caused us to wake up and say, wow, you know, this it's challenging, but Jose is finding a way to do this. And, and what can we learn? And I think there's a lot of benefit to cancer patients into the field as a result of just that tenacity. He was really making us being part of his life and, you know, of his passions, of his uh, uh, goals. So everybody was like really engaged on that. One thing that we've always really valued, especially once we moved to the United States, is these kind of idea of family dinners. So every single night, it's, it's not an option, it's, it's, it's a requirement. And talk about life, politics, and of course, we always ended up about him, you know, talking about our futures and go around the table. It was like, oh, what do you want to do? One of the things Jose did is he dedicated your, maybe not too much time, but the time that he dedicated was very good quality. I mean, he was for you, he was helping, he was helping the kids for the homework. Whenever I tell anyone it's a surprise, it's when we play this video game called FIFA. And he was mom so would bad. Find, mom would find him, we would always play, and I would always destroy him. And like, I wouldn't show him mercy and he would love that, but mom would literally go into the media room at like 3 a.m. in the morning and like see him he practicing. Would practice. <laughs> because you know, you, all of you were like beating him. So it was like 2 o'clock in the morning and he was just saying, doing skill he's sessions. not in bed, where he is. Like and he was doing drills to become better and be able to beat you. And every single time you beat him. That was, that so was his approach like, to life. He got better though, I have to say. He did. We were in Boston only for two years. Memorial Sloan Kettering offered him the position of physician in chief. I did my training at Sloan Kettering as a fellow and took my first faculty position at Sloan Kettering. And about six months into that, Jose was named physician in chief and arrived with a big bang. It was kind of the completion of a career arc for him. He had begun his oncology training as a fellow at Sloan Kettering, then came back at Memorial as really its lead physician and lead researcher. So at MSK, we, uh, we found a perfect, the perfect storm. I was put in a situation where I could really work with oncologists there. There were some years where nothing seemed impossible. It was almost addictive. It created change. It made many people uncomfortable, but I think it made it undoubtedly a, a stronger research institution and left huge impacts on the field, which we're still feeling now. At MSK, we have a project we initially called it the 1,000 Breast Cancer Genome Project, but now it's the 2,000 Breast Cancer Genome Project that we have been able to sequence. And we are beginning to identify genes that are present more frequently in the metastatic setting and that inform us on how to treat these patients. I met Jose about 17 or 18 years ago when I was working at Bristol Myers Squibb. I was living in the United States. Jose was uh, at Valdebron and we were working on a drug uh, that we wanted to develop in breast cancer. He wanted to change the world. He wanted to change the world of how we treat cancer patients. You know, he was constantly seeing patients, so he was putting the research that he was doing constantly in the context of the um, patients 
that he was seeing as a, as a collective and he also had individual patients in mind at times when he was talking about some of the data about why why it was relevant and why we should be doing um you know certain shifts in treatment one of the things that you will hear again and again about Jose Basaga I heard it repeatedly at his memorial is this idea that he had an uncanny way of reading patterns so that when other people looked at data in trials of all kinds, uh, where data patterns are basically what you're interpreting, Jose would have like a, a seventh sense, not just a sixth sense, of what was happening in a pattern that might be leading to a discovery. He could see patterns in a way that a composer can hear music, in the way that a poet pulls words out of thin air without knowing where they're coming from, what we mean by inspiration, why we have ideas like the muse. He once joked to me that there was the muse of science. He said there's not just the muse of poetry, there's the muse of science. You have to listen to her. Even when he was the physician in chief at Sloan Kettering, a job that's incredibly demanding and, and arguably is the job of two or three you know, normal people, Jose maintained a pretty active clinical practice. I got more than a couple of, of phone calls and emails from Jose at my time at Sloan Kettering saying, I have this, this patient, you need to find a spot on this clinical trial for my patient. And I have to say, it was not a relaxing experience trying to make sure that you got um, Jose's patients on the clinical trials, but it's just a marker for how important it was to him. He certainly didn't need his patient practice to pay his salary. The patient that I've met before, um, they tell me, I didn't know what to do. I was already planning for the worst. I walked into your dad's office and when I got out, I was a different person. I had like um, this energy to continue fighting and almost like if, if someone has, had given me a second life. So he was the kind of physician who kept your curiosity awake, who kept your will to live, and he kept your sense of purpose. Um, he didn't make you feel like, you know, you had a purpose, which was this existence, and then cancer came along and you no longer had that purpose and you were no longer on your uh, path of life. He made you feel like you were on your path of life and now had a new um, uh, aperture in it. Jose was doing extremely well at Mass General. This, this concept of precision oncology was live, but the pool, the gravitational pool of this home where he trained, was impossible for Jose to refuse. So now he goes and becomes physician in chief there and things become orders of magnitude more difficult. This is now a really large place. The atmosphere in New York, the competitive nature of various centers there is, is pretty intense. And now he's much higher in the organizational structure of an institution, what he does has a profound impact on even more people than it did in Mass General. Some of these doubts, again, creeped in him. And I had discussions with him about that. And he fought it the way he always does, with hard work, with sense of urgency, with insisting on focus, demanding success. Jose, at that point, I think you 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 start being unaware of your blind spots. Jose was questioned about his uh, lack of divulging uh, his uh, conflicts of interest. And here we have this amazing trailblazing scientist and all of a sudden everyone is questioning his character and his integrity. It was a very sad time in his uh, career. I was informed by him that there was this investigation going on about some uh, undisclosed conflict of interest in some papers at Memorial Sloan Kettering. There was a few more articles talking about more people having some problems not doing well their disclosures. And you know, was he was the only one who was uh, who was targeted, and he had to resign from the Morris Long Cabin. Do I think it was exaggerated, and uh, and he paid too much for what he did? Yes. The saddest part um, is the you know the patients, right? Like all of a sudden you you're diagnosed with this very scary disease, and you get your doctor removed from it. 
there's no excuse for not disclosing relevant financial interests and it's not, I would not make excuses on his behalf for that. None of the findings reported in any of those clinical manuscripts or scientific manuscripts were ever called into question. So the, the real issue is how do we, you know, was the appropriate context and disclosure given? And I think really the, the whole idea of disclosures is something that the field can, needs to continue to work on. It's not just about disclosing, but it's really about like, how interpretable are those disclosures? He thought he will never have the chance to go to the industry either because what happened to Memorial. First time at uh, Rosé Baselga was at the ASCO in 2000 and he was at the time a young, very promising oncologist uh, still working in Barcelona. And I was immediately impressed with him and I met him on a regular basis over the years. And I tried to recruit him a couple of times and when he left Memorial, I knew of course we would have to deal with some criticism, but I knew uh, that Rosé actually would uh, be someone who would uh, live our values and do the right thing. And quite frankly, I thought to myself, well, uh, what is a loss for Memorial would be a gain for AstraZeneca. Here is our chance to attract Rosé and recruit him. And Pascal called me up over the Christmas holidays, um, just before Jose was announced, to sort of tell me the reorganization and what he was planning to do, and I was over the moon. I was looking for someone who had uh, quite a number of qualities, someone who was not able only to paint the strategy, but also um, to understand the science and understand the clinical aspects. Someone who was able to dive into a protocol and discuss it with the teams and understand what this science could mean for patients. So I needed a visionary, but I also needed someone who was practical, entrepreneurial. I also needed someone who was a great leader who uh, was gonna be a talent magnet. And finally, I needed someone who I knew was going to fit uh, our company culture and live our values. And really, Rosé addressed all these aspects I was looking for and was the perfect candidate for the job. When he started at AstraZeneca, things started completely differently. Uh, he thought working there, developing new uh, drugs and trying to figure out new ways of curing he was not only taking care of one patient, but he was taking care of a lot of patients. When he knew that I was considering coming to, uh, to, to AstraZeneca, you know, building again the team, it was like, you know, the John Belushi in the Blues Brother once again. And he was, well, I'm here, so. He said, Sunil, it's time for us to rewrite breast cancer textbooks together. It's time for us to rewrite these chapters. The twinkle in his eyes, the excitement, and it got us really charged up about the opportunity and made me charged up to move countries and move jobs and join AstraZeneca and because I knew I would always have a strong champion, a strong leader who would support uh, this vision. And it was one day that Jose called me. I was a Pfizer. I was incredibly happy. He was telling me, I am in AstraZeneca now and I want to bring you in. It took about 30 minutes for me to decide that I was in. 30 minutes. And once he decided to go, he was just Jose Baselga once again. And I think after two weeks, he was the one um, suggesting to spend a ridiculous amount of money to buy a drug that now he's a blockbuster and he will be even more a blockbuster. He was never daunted by the amount of things that he had. He just boasted about the fact that at Memorial, at Mass General, he'd always been able to get the budget that he needed. He was going to be able to get the budget that he needed here. And he was quite effective at arguing for that, you know, including for doing big deals like in her too, uh, and the, the subsequent deal we did with Daiichi Sankyo. I saw him a couple months after he was named into his position at AstraZeneca at the ACR conference. This was shortly after the announcement that AstraZeneca had done, done a deal with Daiichi to, um, to collaborate on what became in her too. Um, and is now, you know, understood to be kind of a radical transformation for patients with HER2-positive breast cancer. And I saw him and I, I congratulated him on the deal and he said to me, you know, um, Sylvia, my wife, was, was really upset. And my mom went crazy. 
Um, she was like, haven't you had enough? Like all this risk taking, you just joined this company. Are you trying to make enemies? Are you trying to get your boss to fire you? Like, what is up? And he really believed in it. And so he went for it. Um, and I so wish he could see right now um, how good the results are. You know, he saw that this was gonna be a transformative medicine. He knew it was the right thing to do for patients and for the company. And it didn't matter that he was his tenure there was new. It didn't matter that he was coming off of a difficult point in his career. And he other people might have played it more safe. He was going to do what was right and he was gonna kind of let any of the consequences be damned. Uh, obviously, time has shown that to be a brilliant decision, but I thought it also was quintessentially Jose. And for us, for AstraZeneca to be able to partner with Aikisankyo and develop this drug in patients with cancer brings us closer to our goal, which is to eliminate cancer as a cause of death. Pepe and I were living at home. I think it was late November. He was playing tennis with you when he fell. And I think from there, um, he was losing his balance a bit. I mean, at first we thought it was a sight thing, and then we thought it was a balance thing, and then we thought he might be too stressed out at work. He was aware that there were things that were not going well, but he was convinced it was something very acute. So he thought maybe it was some problems with his eye. And I think we went probably to six or seven doctors. So there were all of the symptoms, I think, that they were adding up. Then Alex came home for I was, Thanksgiving. I was in college, and it was Thanksgiving break, Christmas. and I... But Mama I, hadn't said anything to you, had she? Well, she had said that there were some issues with his walking. So yeah. I thought maybe it was like, fall and tennis, you know, yeah. like a muscle thing. I hadn't, I didn't know it was this bad. And I was just so surprised. Like, I, I was like, this that is a different person. That first night, you were in shock. Like, he cannot walk. He is like... You know, that would be someone who was working really hard and he's going to bed at eight or nine. Craswell-Jacob disease is a very vicious disease in that it starts when a protein in your brain, for some reason that people do not understand fully, misfolds. And proteins are the workhorses of our bodies, right? They do everything. They lift, they, they give energy, they, they do everything. And so when this protein misfolds, it becomes contagious. And the thing that's so scary about it is that it manifests differently in every person depending on what, where the first protein misfolds. And in him, it was subtle at first and it was not cognitive. And because he was such an intelligent person, we couldn't tell until it really took over sort of the frontal lobe. The other thing about Kratzel-Jakob disease that's really interesting is that it does have a lot of things similar with other neurodegenerative diseases. So it is much more rapid, it is much more aggressive. If you ask me that he's gonna be dead in six months later, uh after we played last tennis game where he was perfect, full of energy, winning. Uh, not a, even a single you know, sign that he's gonna be sick or he'll be dead in a few months. N would never you know, cross your mind that this would happen to someone like him. I reached out to Jose when I heard he was sick. He didn't respond and I took that kind of as a, as a both an ominous sign um, but also because he would you know, usually respond within seconds of my messaging him, but also as a kind of sign that um, whatever was happening with him, he, he wanted it to be um, a private experience. I kept sending him text messages and um, keeping him up to date on things that I thought were big news. And um, the last text that I got from him was in late January. And um, he said, uh, it's strange. I've never felt like this before in my life. And he was, of course, referring to his degenerative CNS situation. And I know that he could feel that his brain was changing. He said, but never have I wanted to come back and fight alongside you as much as I do right now. And I'm really, really grateful that uh, I sent him the text that inspired him to send that back, because that's the last thing that I took with me. So we decided to go back to Spain and we went to Barcelona incognito mode. We didn't want anyone to know because he was a very proud person and because um, we just sort of felt that he wanted to be with us. Um, and, and this was also part, you made an executive decision there, which I thought was great because uh, we got to spend time with him. And um, we decided that once he passed away, we would start this crowdfunding effort instead of 
flowers. But here also weirdly, and this is strange, you talk a lot about like neurology and you'd be like, that is the future of science. Something that I would recommend future scientists to go into because there's a lot of work to do. And you know, looking at what happened at him where he got this horrible illness with no cure, very little knowledge, very little treatment. You know, he, he was absolutely right. I think that's a field where there's a big gap. It was so sad to be sitting in a doctor's office having received this diagnosis and asking, is there anything we can do? It doesn't matter what the odds are because this guy doesn't care about odds, never has. So just give us something, anything. And we got nothing. And when we left the room, he said, you know, Clara, come here. What do you think about that interaction? And I was like, well, it's really sad that, you know, they gave us this new, he was like, no, no, I'm talking about the setup. Did you see the setup of the doctor's office? It was all wrong because he had his computer in front of him. And so it didn't really facilitate like a, and at this point he was like already having lapses. I thought, you know, if I had been him, I would be breaking. He took that as a teaching moment for, for me as a future doctor. and. That stayed with me. So. I think that a lot of people will just know my dad for everything that he's done in the world of science and the world of academia. But I just think like the, the legacy of my father should just go so much further than that. The person who he was away from all of that, you know, he was just the most caring, compassionate human being in the entire planet. It could have been his birthday, it could have been Christmas, it could have been the happiest moment of his life, but if someone else was in need, he would have put everything aside to help them. But if I could, you know, plead people to hold on to, it would be this humanistic side of him that I come to value tremendously. When he got diagnosed, um, he was already almost not fully aware of what was going on and his cognitive system was not working as it should, as it was normally working. Um, and also like, Something that was really hard is like you wanted to say all these things, but at the same time, you didn't want to constantly remind him that he was dying. And I think that, that made it really difficult to say all you wanted to say. The way I thought about approaching the whole situation is like, how do I make him feel loved without kind of like making it so obvious and so clear that, you know, these are our final days together. Um, so yeah, I think there's probably a lot that I was not able to say um, that, yeah, I, I wish I could have told him, yeah. I think we, we were a good team. We, you know, we complement each other very well. And I was more in the, you know, in the details, in making sure that everything will be stable at home so he could go and work hard. Um, we were in the same um path in terms of how to educate and how to dedicate our time to the kids so that we were like one person instead of being two, which it helped us a lot. But I think working, you know, he was the one with dreams, with enthusiasm, with new projects, and I was the one to help him to develop that all the time. So it's been, it worked very nicely. I think I had, I was very privileged to live 30 years with him. It's the best thing that could happen to me. That's obviously the great irony and tragedy of the end of Jose's life that he he should, you know, suffer such a horrific disease of which there's absolutely no treatment. And I think that's the position that cancer patients found themselves in 50 years ago. Kind of, it was a field of diagnosis rather than treatment. And I hope that um, Clara and and her generation of upcoming scientists and physicians can offer um, hope to people in that situation moving forward. In the aftermath of his, of his death, for months we had been wanting to do something. And we also realized in this, in this, in going through all of this, how little research and money there is in Craswell Jacob disease. So we started this GoFundMe and you know, we wrote a blurb and it was basically like, you know, our father passed away from this disease and we raised a quarter of a million dollars. And I think by the time we had raised like maybe a hundred um, thousand dollars, GoFundMe contacted us and was like, this, this campaign um, is number one in Spain right now. We would like to help you. And so we got more structure, we got more help. 
Now that money, that quarter million dollars, has been given to Hospital Clinique, and they're doing basically um, clinical research with it. And so that's one project, but AstraZeneca has also um, given us a million dollars for CJD research. And then the other part of it is awareness. You know, there is a lot of stigma with Castle Jacob disease, and part of it is it's closely related to mad cow disease because the variant form of CJD is mad cow. And so just by talking about it, sharing our story, sharing the symptoms, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's for me and at least a way to stay connected to him. I can't think of a better way to honor him than to put energy into science. Really, I think the contributions that Jose made were twofold to the individual medicines that he produced, to the broader ideas of precision medicine, the idea that we should be personalizing therapy for people with cancer, but probably most profoundly in the legacy of trainees that he, he really brought through. I mean, there are many people that consider themselves trainees of Jose that are now leaders in academia, leaders in industry. I feel lucky to count myself amongst that. Um, Jose was hugely impactful for my career. He was hugely impactful for the way that I think about oncology, about oncology research, about trying to advance patient care. But there were moments that were deeply uncomfortable um, and you had to live through those moments and you had to accept them as part of the equation of working with Jose. I don't regret a moment of working with him and I, I miss it. The thing I miss most about uh, Jose is, is how he brought the best out of us. And I, I miss that sometimes when I want that feeling of somebody who's gonna push me. And I, I want to instill that Jose in me to push me even more so I can raise my bar. I miss that clarity of vision. Um, and, I, and I hope that's in us, it's in me, um, to provide the direction that we need moving forward. Cancer is a brutal disease, brutal disease. It devastates people, families. So being a fierce enemy of something like cancer requires fierceness. Uh, and I think um, Jose had that. Jose's legacy in the, uh, in the oncology uh, community is, is enormous. I mean, his impact on breast cancer, in particular HER2 uh, breast cancer and the treatment will be really felt for decades to come. He was the champion of uh, the working relationship with Daiichi to have uh, this drug be available to patients through uh, this collaboration uh, through AstraZeneca. And then the trial that showed a tremendous difference uh, between, uh, between HER2 and the competing drugs in a head-to-head -head comparison uh, proved him right. Everybody felt sad that uh, Jose didn't live to see that because he would have been so proud of it. He was such an amazing personality. Um, he, he combined this strong work ethic with a charismatic personality that, that everybody wanted to be near him and learn from him. And, uh, you know, people like that come along once in a while, you know. And so um, I, I think there is a void. Of course, he has left a legacy, particularly in the area of molecular targeted therapies and uh, the molecular profiling that he pushed very hard as a comprehensive approach to uh, cancer therapeutics. And we'll never forget him. He was an extraordinary person and an amazing scientist. He was tougher on himself than he was on the people uh, around him. And that the goal was always very clear. The goal is making a difference for patients. And to that end, it was worth um, pushing and driving. Uh, and I'm very comfortable with the push and the drive. <laughs> and I always understood where he was coming from. So I never, I never minded the uh, slightly uh, rougher edges. I thought that was it's just part of the man that he was. Um, and I loved the, the totality of it. Oh, I, I did cry my eyes out, obviously, through the, through the whole year because he's, he was um, he was unbelievable in terms of being a giant, being recognized globally, but also having little time for the little things, you know, is, and, and then you think, how does he have time for all this? <laughs> well, Jose did have the ability to combine true genius 
together with a remarkable emotional intelligence and an amazing sense of humor. Um, sometimes this just felt like, you know, the guy next door. And then other times you realize that you were sitting next to like the Serena Williams of the oncology field or the Steve Jobs of the oncology field. Yet he was just another guy that was interested in talking about Barcelona versus Real Madrid and his time serving in the army in Northern Africa. That mix was what made him so special. The Sagrada Familia made me think about Jose. It's towering, it is singularly noteworthy, and yet it's tragically unfinished. And, and that made me think about his life because his life was so impactful, and yet it was cut too short. It, it's tragically unfinished. When I think about what Jose was pursuing in his life, just an enemy that is cancer, like with the Sagrada Familia, the finishing is left to others. We, we find out that he was, uh, his disease, he decided yeah. that he went to spend the last months in La Cerdaña. That was very remarkable because it's how important it was for him to be there yeah. and see the mountains and spend some time walking, you know, yeah. through La Tosa, all these lovely, yeah. you know, places that we stayed together. And my question to you is, who's gonna be next? What are you gonna to do to move the field forward? Because we are in an urgent need to make sure that all this knowledge continues to be developed and applied to patients. He's him with his younger brother, Louis. He's so young. And, and he's there. Bishop and then here, it's in different ages. Mm -hmm. Here's when he was younger. And then yeah. here, it looks so well. It looks like you. It's very yeah. similar like you are. Look at all and the ropes. We have the castle of Cardona. You see his face? He's like, he looks, you know. That's why it's well, hard. the ball, the ball's okay. Well, what's going to be important? Marco's loving it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mom. This is the back which had this bike in the garage. We still have it. We still have it. And that is him with his father. And him is a friend from Cardona. Um, and there, yeah, a few of them are over there. I think this one is it's one of the, the best bit. Yeah. 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 That so this was the first draft of my medical school uh, paper. And here he says, too long. What point are you trying to make? He would use, do this when he ran out of space. He, he would do a little like arrow and he goes writer, physician, scientist. 